Family values. Between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism. This is chapter two, part one. Uh, the moral crisis of inflation, neoliberalism, neoconservatism, and the demise of the family wage. During every great inflation, there's a striking decline in both public and private morality. That's a quote from Henry Hazlitt um, from The Inflation Crisis and How to Resolve It. In 1979, the incoming chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, initiated a new era in American political life by taking decisive action on inflation. After years of increasingly polarized debate, Volcker deployed the technocratic instrument of covert interest rate adjustment and the ideological cover of monetarism to plunge the American economy into its deepest period of recession since the Great Depression, thereby ending a long drawn out process of, process of spiraling inflation. The so-called Volcker shock created the conditions for the Reagan revolution and profoundly reshaped the landscape of American and global politics over the following decades. It is at this turning point that neoliberalism and neoconservatism and their derivatives emerged as fully fledged social philosophies and dominant forces on the political stage. But it was in the preceding decade in response to the combined problems of inflation and rising unemployment that neoliberals and neoconservatives first elaborated and perfected their signature critique of the great society welfare state. If we are to understand how a discourse of crisis was born and how neoliberalism and neoconservatism leveraged this discourse to redefine the terms of political power over the following years, it is imperative that we revisit the debates of this period and question the established historical accounts of their resolution. The economic and political factors that contributed to the inflation of the 1970s are well known, although few would claim to calculate the precise weight of each contributing cause. It is widely believed that President Lyndon Johnson pre precipitated the onset of inflation in the late 1960s by refusing to cut back on military expenditures, even while he initiated an ambitious new program of health, welfare, and education spending under the aegis of the Great Society. Historically, periods of inflation have routinely followed the exceptional military expenditures of wartime. President Johnson launched a disastrous new war in Vietnam while at the same time pursuing an expansionary domestic politics at home, a double venture that may have been feasible if, we, if he had at the same time increased revenue from taxes. Inflation also reflected a shift in the old balance of powers between former colonial states and the metropolitan centers. America's military venture in Vietnam came at a time when many former colonies were gaining independence and were able to demand higher prices for their export commodities, a shift that ultimately fed into the price of all consumer commodities, from food to oil. By the mid-1970s, America was importing a third of its oil from foreign sources, as compared to one-fifth in 1960. This left the entire productive and consumer economy vulnerable to the oil embargoes imposed by OPEC in 1973 and 1979. These then were the key factors contributing to the economic phenomenon of consumer price inflation. How and why inflation became a political crisis is less clear. Today, many, if not most, accounts of the economic predicament of the 1970s subscribe to the idea that inflation represented an unmitigated crisis for all social classes, a narrative that has hardened into orthodoxy in the wake of the Reagan Revolution, and which in itself represents the triumph of a certain kind of revisionist analysis. The historian Ewan Morgan contends that the 1970s represented the most miserable period for the United States economy since the Great Depression of the 1930s, bringing to an end the perpetual increase in living standards that had marked the post-war era. Drawing on the work of the neoconservative Daniel Bell, the economic sociologist Greta Kripner attributes the bitter distribution or distributional struggles of the 1970s to increasingly severe limits on the nation's prosperity. Without asking how and where wealth was being redistributed, 
and how a marked trend toward downward re redistribution might have precipitated a neoconservative discourse around limits to growth in the first place. Yet more than one contemporary observer of these economic trends acknowledged that the redistributive consequences of inflation were far from transparent. The economist Edward N. Wolfe, who conducted a study investigating the effects of inflation on household wealth between 1969 and 1974, went so far as to argue that inflation acted like a progressive tax, leading to greater equality in the distribution of wealth. The force of trade unionism at the time was such that wages continued to rise alongside the consumer price index, with the consequence that inflation actively benefited those who depended on wages for their income, not on interests and dividends from financial assets. The Brookings Institution economist Joseph J. Minarek found that the benefits were particularly clear for middle-class homeowners, but even the lowest income groups were not as vulnerable to rising prices as was generally assumed, since most social insurance programs were indexed to the consumer price index. Inflation, moreover, had the curious effect of redistributing wealth from creditors to debtors by steadily eroding the price of debt. As long as wages kept rising, it made sense for workers to buy for the future on credit, giving rise to the popular perception that everyday workers were turning into investors and speculators, indulging in luxury consumer goods that had only recently been out of their reach. For those whose net worth derived from financial assets, however, the consequences of inflation were unremittingly negative. Institutional and personal investors, including the wealthiest 10% of households, searched in vain for a safe avenue in, of investment throughout this period as inflation eroded the real rates of return on their long-term financial assets. Uncertainty hovered over the future of investment for rich and poor alike, but whereas the unpredictability of the dollar's future price promised depreciating interest payments to everyday workers and debtors, it signified the exact opposite to the nation's creditors, ever diminishing asset values and the futility of investment itself. By the late 1970s, this situation prompted a sensibility of outright anti-government rebellion among free market neoliberals such as Rose and Milton Friedman, who accused the Federal Reserve of defrauding investors of their wealth via the manipulation of the money supply. For the investment class, the sense of crisis was exacerbated by the fact that the labor unions of the 1970s were able to hold their own against any attempt to push down wages in response to inflation. Business owners lamented the fact that rising costs of production could not be offset by a corresponding rise in labor productivity, as they encountered an ever, encountered an ever more militant and restive workforce. It was similarly impossible for American corporations to recoup losses by pushing up prices, because they were now confronted with rising competitive pressures from Europe and Japan. The growing political influence of organized labor was reflected in the fact that wages continue to rise against a background of high unemployment. This phenomenon, known as stagflation, confounded the predictions of post-war Keynesian economics, which in the form of the so-called Phillips curve posited a stable negative relation between the level of unemployment and the rate of change of wages. For the business and investment class, stagflation was a sign that the Keynesian consensus between labor and capital had outlived its political usefulness. Simply put, what had looked like a consensus solution to all parties in the wake of the Great Depression now appeared to be empowering the working class over investors. Today, a number of scholars argue that the Volcker shock of 1979 must be understood as, as a concerted political response to the rising militancy of the Fordist working class. In their illuminating analyses of this period, the political economists Leo Penich, Sam Gindin, and Edward Dickens remind us that Arthur Burns, chairman of the Federal Reserve between February 1970 and February 1978, openly ascribed the problem of stagflation to the overweening power of trade unions and the social welfare expenditures that, in his view, served to subsidize strikes. These theorists perform the important task of restoring the question of class politics to the historic historiography of inflation, yet they are less successful in accounting for the peculiar focus and moralizing tenor of attacks on social welfare during this period. 
Having assumed an already unified conception of the working class, they cannot tell us why contemporary diagnoses of crisis focused so insistently on one welfare program in particular, AFDC or Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and why that program came to be associated with a general crisis of the American family. Consequently, they are unable to explain how the problematic of family dysfunction became so central to popular understandings of inflation, or why the Reagan-era response to inflation would propel family values to the forefront of American politics over the next several decades. For contemporary commentators, however, the stakes were clear enough. Stakeflation was a problem not only because it skewed the Fordist social consensus in favor of the working class, but also because it threatened to undermine the normative foundations of the Fordist family wage. In effect, by the late 1970s, commentators from across the political spectrum agreed that inflation represented a threat to the moral fabric of American society. With a nod to the work of Frederick Hayek, Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker described inflation as a moral issue. It corrodes trust, particularly trust in government. It is a governmental responsibility to maintain the value of the currency that they issue. And when they fail to do that, it is something that undermines an essential trust in government. Others traced a direct line of causation between this erosion of political trust and the breakdown of traditional family structures. The monetarist Milton Friedman understood inflation as a dangerous distortion of money that undermined its intrinsic neutrality and imposed a fraudulent tax on investors. For Friedman, inflation was foremost a consequence of excessive growth in the money supply, and yet the money supply also became entangled with fiscal policy when the government paid for indulgent social welfare programs by monetizing debt rather than raising taxes or borrowing funds. Inflation then was not only an evil in and of itself, it had also served to finance welfare programs, whose major evil was to undermine the fabric of society, that is, the natural incentives of the family and the market. The Virginia School public choice economists James Buchanan and Richard Wagner discerned an even more direct relationship between inflation and moral crisis. Unlike the monetarist Friedman, the Virginia School economists expounded a fiscal theory of inflation that pointed to government deficits as the primary cause of monetary instability. Accordingly, Buchanan and Wagner did not hesitate to attribute inflation to the decline of the old-time fiscal religion that had once upon a time committed both governments and households to balanced budgets and everyday austerity. By creating uncertainty about the future value of money, they argued, inflation had the effect of shortening time horizons and inducing a desire for speculative indulgence among the consumer public. This in turn had led to a general breakdown in public morality whose effects were visible in everything from expanding welfare roles to sexual pro promiscuity. We do not need to become full-blown Hegelians, they wrote, to entertain the general notion of zeitgeist, spirit of the times. Such a spirit seems at work in the 1960s and 1970s and is evidenced by what appears as a generalized erosion in public and private manners increasingly liberalized attitudes toward sexual activities, a declining vitality of the Puritan work ethic, deterioration in product quality, explosion of the welfare roles, widespread corruption in both the private and the governmental sector, and finally, observed increases in the alienation of voters from the political process. Who can deny that inflation plays some role in reinforcing several of the observed behavior patterns? Inflation destroys expectations and creates uncertainty. It increases the sense of felt injustice and causes alienation. It prompts behavioral responses that reflect a generalized shortening of time horizons. Enjoy, enjoy the imperative of our time becomes a rational response in a setting where tomorrow remains insecure and where the plans made yesterday seem to have been made in folly. The American Hayekian Henry Hazlitt was even more emphatic in his denunciation of the moral effects of inflation. During every great inflation, he wrote, there is a striking decline in both public and private morality. These theorists can all be classified as neoliberals of one kind or another, variously aligned with the competitive price theory of the Chicago School of Economics, the Virginia School of Public Choice Theory, or a peculiar brand of Austrian economics derived from Frederick von Hayek 
and Ludwig von Mises. Each in his or her own way was associated with the resurgence and reinvention of radical free market liberalism in American political and economic thought in the post-war era. For all their singularity, however, the neoliberals offered an understanding of inflation that in key respects converged with that of the neoconservatives, political theorists who were otherwise opposed to the fundamental precepts of economic liberalism. The sociologist Daniel Bell, for instance, perhaps the most famous neoconservative commentator on inflation, thematized the moral and economic crisis of the 1970s in terms very close to those of the Virginia school, neoliberals in particular. His sociological classic, The Cultural Contradictions of Capital, indicted the welfare state for undermining the proper order of familial relations and expanding consumption beyond the limits prescribed by Protestant good sense. Inflation, he believed, was was intimately connected to this breakdown of moral values. Time and again, both neoliberals and neoconservatives focused their attention on one welfare program in particular, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, a marginal public assistance program that consumed a very small proportion of federal social expenditures. How did the great inflation of the 1970s come to be associated with a breakdown of the family? And why did public concern focus so obsessively on this one social welfare program? To answer this question, one must attend to the sinuous complexities of political debate around the Fordist family wage and social welfare through the late 1960s and 1970s. As noted by the historian Marissa Chappell, an initial effort to expand the family wage to African Americans in the early 1970s progressively gave way to a wholesale critique of the family wage itself, a critique that became more vocal as inflation impressed itself on the political agenda. In effect, a bipartisan consensus on the basic premise of redistribution, social welfare, uh, social welfare existed right up until the 1960s. Until this time, Democrats and Republicans alike were committed to the redistributive policies of the family wage, although they were divided on the question of whether or not it should be extended to African-American men. Old Democrats and future neoconservatives, such as Daniel Patrick Moynihan, were convinced that the family wage should include African-American men, a view that shared with many li- that a view they shared with many liberals and leftists in the welfare rights movement. A free market economist such as Milton Friedman preferred the racial, racially neutral solution of a basic guaranteed income channeled through the tax system, although he too remained pragmatically committed to a minimal system of income redistribution. By the late 1970s, however, this consensus had given way to a comprehensive critique of the welfare state tout court. Critics on the left and right now accused AFDC, and by extension the welfare state itself, of radically undermining the American family and contributing to the problem of inflation. In response to this crisis, they now called for a much more dramatic reform of welfare than they themselves had hitherto imagined. It was now agreed that the redistributive welfare programs of the New Deal and Great Society would need to be radically restricted even while the private institution of of the family was to be strengthened as an alternative to social welfare. Welfare reformers now looked back to a much older tradition of public relief, one embedded in the poor law tradition with its attendant notions of family and personal responsibility as an imagined alternative to the New Deal welfare state. It is in the shift that we can relocate, that we can locate the simultaneous rise of neoliberalism and neoconservatism as mature political philosophies. <clears throat> Neoliberalism and neoconservatism may be diametrically opposed on many issues, but on the question of family values, they repeal a surprising affinity. AFDC, welfare, and the American family wage. The controversy surrounding AFDC is in many respects illuminated by the peculiar position it holds within the history of the American welfare state and family wage. Unlike many European welfare states, and indeed unlike the welfare policies of the American progressive era, the American New Deal did not espouse an overtly gendered politics of the family. 
a fact that the Catholic Daniel Moynihan lamented. In its administrative and institutional form, however, the New Deal set forth a series of abstract category distinctions that subtly served to reinforce the privilege of the white male breadwinner family. By sorting citizens according to the purportedly neutral category of employment status, the New Deal created a welfare system that was highly divided along the lines of gender and race. Its panoply of programs, moreover, came under the jurisdiction of different levels of government, with federal, with federal programs administering a far more impersonal, generous, and predictable system of benefits than the states, which were free to exercise considerable discretion in the distribution of welfare. The hierarchization of welfare benefits was further inscribed in the very design of welfare programs. Social insurance programs that targeted lifelong workers and collected con contributions from workers or their employers or their employer, sorry, from workers or their employers enjoyed a much higher social status than the public assistance programs reserved for the non-contributing poor. Public assistance came under the rubric of relief programs and was highly dependent on prevailing public opinion about the deserving or undeserving character of the poor. ADC fell on the wrong side of each of these institutional divides. Aid to dependent children, as AFDC was first called, was one of the many welfare programs created by the Social Security Act of 1935. Although it was a public assistance program and subject to a high level of public scrutiny and state discretion, it inherited its original structure from the earlier Mother's Pensions Program and therefore enjoyed a certain level of respect. Mother's pensions had embodied the family wage ideal of the progressive era, which mandated that white women and their children should be supported by the state in the event of their husband's death. The Social Security Act nationalized this program and reproduced many of its normative ideals. Unlike social insurance programs, however, which were heavily regulated by the federal government, ADC allowed states considerable freedom to enact and appropriate funds with the result that many states funded the program poorly and were highly restrictive in their allocation of benefits. Many states replicated progressive era rules that favored widows over women who had divorced or who had never married, and most southern states excluded African American women on the grounds that their work was needed outside the home. The predictable result was that, at least in the first few years of the program, most ADC recipients were white. In 1939, however, the Social Security Act was changed to allow widows formerly covered by ADC to access the more respectable Old Age Insurance, OAI, if they had been married to men covered by the program. This decision allowed deserving women to upgrade to a more respectable form of family wage allowance, one that was premised on a woman's attachment to an independent male worker in standard long-term employment. But the elevation of a certain class of women, mostly white and middle class, to a more respectable social insurance program also led to the further devaluation of the status of ADC. By default, ADC was now primarily reserved for widows who had been married to poorer men and to unmarried, divorced, or separated mothers. Increasingly, it also became associated with African American women. During the post-war era, the composition of ADC changed dramatically as the number of African-American women signing up outpaced that of white women, and more divorced or never-married women joined the rules. These changes were linked to the transformation of the southern plantation economy and the racial composition of the forest labor force. The mechanization of agriculture in the south compelled many African-Americans to migrate to the northern Rust Belt cities, where they filled non-unionized non non and non-insured positions in factories. Few African American men enjoyed the family wage privileges of the unionized industrial labor force, and as a surplus population of cheap workers, African Americans in general experienced a disproportionate level of unemployment, even during the boom years of the 1960s. In the North, however, state rules governing the allocation of ADC benefits were often less restrictive than those in the South. By 1961 then, 48% of African American women were on ADC, and many of these were single mothers. Although, as Primilla Nadison notes, 
Their numbers were far lower than one would expect given actual rates of poverty and out-of-wedlock birth. ADC had always been a restrictive program, but faced with what the public perceived as a flagrant affront to the ideals of white American motherhood, many states responded to the 1939 amendments by redoubling their efforts to police the morality of welfare recipients. By the late 1950s, even the northern states, which previously had been more generous, reinforced old laws or invented new ones to limit ADC payments to deserving mothers. These laws functioned as a kind of negative of the white family wage ideal embodied in mothers' pensions, their multiple exclusions serving to define the boundaries of state-subsidized reproduction. Man in the House rules allowed states to refuse benefits to women who lived with or were in a sexual relationship with a man, deeming him a proper substitute for the paternal function of the state. Suitable home laws allowed welfare caseworkers to deny aid to unmarried or a moral woman. Employable mother laws, often invoked in the South, designated African American women as indispensable workers outside the home and therefore excluded them from the domestic ideal of white motherhood, while residence laws sought to discourage interstate migrants from applying for assistance. Despite the ostensible neutrality of federal welfare law then in practice, public assistance programs were qualified by a panoply of state administrative laws that strictly police the moral and racial boundaries of the Fortis family wage. These racial and sexual normativities were truly foundational to the social order of American Fordism, determining just who would be included and who would be excluded from the redistributive benefits of the social wage. By the 1960s, however, some of the more egregious forms of police power em embodied in state administrative law were coming under challenge as welfare recipients became increasingly organized and civil rights lawyers transferred their judicial activi activism to the field of welfare. During this period, the Supreme Court was receptive to plaintiffs who challenged the right of the states to deviate from the general terms of federal welfare law. In a series of test cases initiated by welfare rights activists and public interest lawyers, the Supreme Court proceeded to limit the prerogative of state welfare agencies to make judgments about the perceived morality of welfare recipients. In one particularly significant case, King v. Smith, Decided in 1968, the Supreme Court unanimously overturned the state of Alabama's substitute father, or substitute father rule, which denied benefits to women who were in a sexual relationship with a man. The decision enraged conservative Republicans and Southern Democrats who believed that African American women on welfare were benefiting from a program that was not designed for them in the first place but it also troubled a surprising number of liberals and leftists who thought that welfare activism should be focused on the task of restoring and promoting the Afri African-American male breadwinner family rather than subsidizing the non-normative lifestyles of unattached African-American women. Moynihan, the left, and the black family wage. In June 1965, President Johnson delivered a remarkable speech before the graduating class of Howard University, a traditionally African-American institution with strong ties to the civil rights movement. Reflecting on the progress of the Great Society reforms, Johnston, Johnson acknowledged that neither opportunity liberalism nor the formal recognition of civil rights would be enough to overcome the enduring legacy of racial discrimination in the United States. The most important factor in the persistence of black disadvantage, he argued, was the breakdown of the Negro family structure. Accordingly, any effort to go beyond the Great Society agenda would require both affirmative action and a comprehensive program to strengthen the African-American family. The Howard University speech had been drafted by Richard N. Goodwin and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, advisors in the early Johnson administration, and reflected the content of a report, then unpublished, that Moynihan had recently written. The report, entitled The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, would prove much more divisive than Johnson's speech before an audience of African Americans graduating students. In this study, Moynihan reflected on post-war trends in the formation of black and white families, the changing composition of welfare roles, and the rising in un unemployment rates among young black men, 
all familiar themes to readers of the popular press, and offered a long zude historical analysis to account for them. For Moynihan, the contemporary situation of African Americans living in the inner cities was unambiguously pathological. High rates of criminality, youth alienation, and unemployment were all signs that something was seriously wrong, and this malaise could ultimately be traced to the disintegration of the Black family. Moynihan lingered over the details of this apparent disintegration, the rising rates of separation, divorce, unwedded childbearing, and female-headed families in which women had assumed an un an unnaturally dominant and overbearing role. As many critics on the left would point out, the Moynihan report subtly shifted the focus of attention away from the structural factors of urban segregation, discrimination, and educational disadvantage that might implicate contemporary white racism in the reproduction of poverty and pointed instead to the distant crime of slavery as a causal factor. By destroying the proper order of gender relations in the African-American family, slavery had engendered a pathological kinship structure that was transmitted from generation to generation and was now quite capable of perpetuating itself without assistance from the white world. Yet Moynihan did concede that New Deal social welfare policy had also played a key role in exacerbating the decline of the black family. In particular, he singled out AFDC as responsible for allowing this process of decline to proceed as far and as fast as it had done in the 1960s. The steady expansion of this welfare program, he wrote, can be taken as a measure of the steady, steady disintegration of the Negro family structure over the past generation in the United States. In 1965, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was not yet a self-identified neoconservative. Although Irving Kristol points to 1965 as the year in which the neoconservative movement was born, Moynihan was still very much a New Deal Democrat at this time, one with decidedly social democratic leanings. An enthusiastic adherent of Johnson's Great Society agenda, Moynihan was in favor of extending the New Deal welfare state beyond its original constituencies by including African American men within the family wage. Moynihan's views on welfare were shaped by a Catholic social philosophy that had, long seen, that had long seen the welfare state as the ideal conduit of family values. He was concerned, however, that the abstract individualism favored by American liberalism had undermined the implicit familial, familialism of the New Deal vision, allowing a program such as AFDC to subsidize frankly pathological forms of sexuality, as its, as its constituencies changed. As a solution, he urged Johnson to adopt a national family policy on a par with the Employment Act of 1945 and to include all races within its provisions. The Moynihan Report met a hostile reception from many liberals and leftists who otherwise supported the goal of progressive welfare reform. By the mid-1960s, a coalition of middle-class liberals and radical leftists had united around the cause of pushing for a more generous and activist expansion of welfare than that envisaged by Johnson's rather tepid Great Society reforms. This coalition included established labor unions, welfare associations, religious charities, city, civil rights groups, social workers on the liberal spectrum, and farther to the left, more radical groups such as the Black Nationalist Movement, the Emerging National Welfare Rights Organization, and feminist activists. Independently, these activists had developed an analysis of racial injustice that, that responded precisely or that responded to precisely the kind of malaise identified by Moynihan, but whose causes they had carefully located outside of the African-American community itself in the enduring nature of structural discrimination. Many of these people responded angrily to the tone of Moynihan's report, accusing him of pandering to existing psychocultural psych psychocultural explanations of African-American oppression. It is this hostile reaction that is most often recalled in contemporary accounts of the Moynihan Report. And yet, as the historian Marissa Chapel has recently argued in some detail, the anathema surrounding Moynihan's name has tended to obscure the considerable affinity between Moynihan's family wage ideology and leftist and liberal conceptions of welfare reform at the time. The liberal and left coalition for welfare reform may have quibbled with causes of African-American disadvantage 
adduced by Moynihan. Yet they were in fundamental agreement on the point that this that this disadvantage undermined the family and that any long-term solution to racism would therefore re require an effort to restore the African-American family and the place of men within it. This consensus reached across the spectrum of liberal and left participants in the welfare reform movement. Reformist civil rights leaders such as Martin Luther King were sympathetic to the findings of the report, while, while black Muslim and black nationalist leaders were in frank, frank agreement with its suggestions of pathological matriarchy and male castration. But even those on the radical labor left were receptive to Moynihan's arguments. A few years after the publication of Moynihan's report, a new kind of labor activism would erupt on Detroit's auto plants as African-American workers, both men and women, adopted strike tactics outside the wage bargaining framework of the New Deal labor unions. Brought together under the umbrella of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in 1969, these unions openly repudiated the reformist and assimilationist method methods of civil rights activism on the one hand and the white New Deal labor unions on the other. But they were by no means hostile to the family wage arguments preferred by Moynihan. Indeed, even while the first wildcat strikes were initiated by women, the revolutionary unions saw the restoration of African-American manhood via an extension of the New Deal family wage to black men as the ultimate aim of their extra-legal activism. In the meantime, the sociologist Richard Cloward, who helped found the National Welfare Rights Organization in 1966, was as forceful as Moynihan in condemning AFDC. Cloward could hardly be accused of New Deal reformism. Along with Francis Piven, Richard Cloward famously co-authored the 1966 Call to Arms, The Weight of the Poor, a strategy to end poverty, which advocated a strategy of crisis for pushing through a radical overhaul of the American welfare system. The article pointed to the fact that the actual numbers of poor people receiving benefits was much lower than it should have been due to, due to the multiple institutional obstacles which prevented eligible citizens from recognizing and claiming their welfare dues. Piven and Cloward understood this discrepancy to be a constitutive feature of rights discourse. Their activism then was not based so much on an appeal to formal rights as a strategy of sabotage through excessive deference to the letter of the law. If all eligible poor people were to claim their welfare rights en masse, the welfare system would be overwhelmed and the state would be forced to institute a guaranteed income instead. This strategy rested on the idea that the formal equality promised by federal welfare law could, if taken at its word, force a more revolutionary change on the state. Despite their methodological radicalism, what Cloward and Piven meant by a basic guaranteed income was in fact a male breadwinner's wage. Thus, where Moynihan suggested that increasing enrollments in AFDC were a symptom of the disintegration or of the disintegrating black family, Cloward and Piven went further and identified AFDC as a leading cause of family breakdown, commenting on local programs to train welfare mothers for work in the nation. They complained that such measures reinforce the female as breadwinner in an already female headed household. Men for whom there are no jobs will nevertheless meet like other men, but they are not so likely to marry. Our society has preferred to deal with the resulting female-headed families not by putting men to work, but by, but by placing the unwed men and oh, fuck, by, but by placing the unwed mothers and dependent children on public welfare, substituting check writing machines for male wage earners. By this means, we have robbed men of manhood, women of husbands, and children of fathers. To create a stable monogamous family, we need to provide men, especially Negro men, with the opportunity to be men, and, the, and that involves enabling them to perform occupationally. Over the long term, women will then leave the welfare roles, not to work, but marry. This statement published in the same year as the Moynihan Report attests to the considerable political affinity between Moynihan and the founding members of the National Welfare Rights Organization. However loudly these leftists disavowed the details of the Moynihan Report, there was very little of substance to distinguish their positions. To be sure, the family wage politics of welfare activists such as Piven and Cloward did not exhaust the spectrum of positions 
held within the National Welfare Rights Organization. In fact, many of the welfare mother activists, who would later assume a more dominant position in the organization, articulated a much more complex position on the intersections of race, sexuality, and gender, and were critical of the family wage tout court. Yet, it was the male breadwinner activism of leftists such as Cloward and Piven that resonated most strongly with the new left and the black nationalist movement. The practical, if disavowed, proximity between the Democrat Moynihan and the welfare activists of the new left would soon become even more pronounced when both came out in favor of a new family wage system based on a guaranteed basic income. Nixon and the Black Family Wage, Exercising AFDC In June 1969, the National Welfare Rights Organization officially launched a new campaign in favor of an actual guaranteed income of $5,500. This campaign was designed to phase out AFDC as a stigma or a stigmatized standalone program and to guarantee a living wage to all welfare recipients. In August 1969, on the advice of Moynihan, President Nixon announced a similar program to replace the state-based AFDC with a more secure federal program known as the Family Assistance Plan. Unlike AFDC, the latter targeted working families and promised to extend basic income guarantees to men, to two-parent families, and those engaged in low-waged work. Nixon, who adopted the plan against the advice of his more conservative colleagues, envisaged the reform as a way of extending the family wage to black men while catering to the resentment of the mostly white lower income workers who felt excluded from existing public assistance programs. In its broad conception, the family assistance plan was inspired by Moynihan's arguments in favor of the black family wage. By extending welfare to men in two-parent households, the proposed reform was designed to eliminate what many saw as the perverse disincentives to family formation that were built into the AFDC program. Its practical blueprint was based on the idea of a negative income tax, first proposed by Milton Friedemann in 1962. Friedemann conceived of the negative income tax as a way of channeling income redistribution through the federal tax system thereby eliminating the excessive administrative costs associated with dedicated welfare programs. Those whose income fell below a certain threshold would receive a fraction of their unused tax exemptions and deductions in return, guaranteeing them an annual basic income. By, re by replacing in-kind welfare with the most liquid form of benefit, cash, Friedman thought that the negative income tax would encourage the poor to behave as responsible free market actors. He also specified that those in low wage work should continue to receive subsidies in order to avoid the moral hazard of promoting non work. With its minimal but efficient system of redistribution, the negative income tax would bypass the disabling paternalism of the welfare state and undermine the entrenched power based of based the entrenched power base of liberal welfare bureaucrats. The fact that Nixon's proposal for an expanded family wage attracted such a broad alliance of supporters embracing the Republican president and moderate conservative Richard Nixon, the neoliberal Milton Friedman, the Democrat Moynihan, the liberals and leftists of the national welfare rights movement, and liberal economists such as John Kenneth Galbraith and James Tobin is testament to the very different political atmosphere of the 1960s. During this period of steady economic growth, Keynesian fiscal expansionism was an orthodoxy shared by left and right. In a reflection on federal welfare reform published in the National Catholic Weekly Review in 1966, Moynihan noted that the United States is, not, is now in the 53rd month of unbroken economic expansion, the longest and strongest in peacetime history. During this brief fleeting period, we have raised the gross national product by some $160 billion. It was now the perfect time, he concluded, to supplement the founding moment of New Deal social reform with a second generation of family-based policies. This remarkable consensus continued into the early years of the Nixon administration, even as inflation became a discernible problem. This is not to say that the various supporters of Nixon's black family wage shared exactly the same vision of reform. 
Among those who supported the plan, differences of opinion were already incipient. Friedemann, for example, envisaged a more frugal form of welfare redistribution than that favored by liberals or leftists. In private correspondence, he conceded that he saw the negative income tax as a pragmatic step towards the elimination of all social welfare programs. But with the exception of a few dissident feminist voices in the national welfare rights movement, all agreed that welfare in its existing form undermined the traditional family, and all converged on the necessity of maintaining some kind of redistributive welfare system. In the 1960s, even Friedemann recognized the need for a basic income redistribution program to ameliorate the inevitable market failures of private charity. In 1970, the Democratic Party controlled House representatives approved Nixon's recommendations by a large majority. Later that year, though, the family assistance plan was roundly defeated by a coalition of Republicans and Democrats in the Senate, presaging a long-term reshuffling of left and right in the American political landscape. Designed to suit all stakeholders, the final version of the family assistance plan ended up disappointing everyone. Welfare rights activists objected that the plan would reduce benefits to well, know, well below the poverty line for most welfare recipients, would eliminate the right to a fair hearing, and would reintroduce arbitrary powers of surveillance. Free market economists such as Friedemann thought the plan ended up complicating rather than streamlining the current welfare bureaucracy and did not sufficiently remove disin disincentives to work. <clears throat> what defeated the plan, however, were not so much these specific objections as Nixon's own decision to abandon the politics of consensus on welfare in a context of rising inflation. In the first year of his presidency, Nixon had surrounded himself with liberal policy advisors such as Moynihan and Robert Finch, who convinced him that an expansion of the family wage was the best way to placate racial tensions, while simultaneously allowing him to wrest the white working class from its traditional allegiance to the Democratic Party. By his second year in government, the economic outlook had soured and Nixon was less convinced that the strategy would work. Instead, he decided, behind closed doors, to abandon any attempt to reform AFDC while simultaneously overseeing some of the most generous expansions to Social Security in the program's history. Social Security was and still is one of the New Deal's less contentious social insurance programs, precisely because it remains relatively untouched by the normative issues of race, gender, and family formation that intersect in programs such as AFDC. When Nixon retreated from the agenda of reforming AFDC then, the extraordinary consensus that had formed around the project of the expanded family wage came apart and the moral crisis, oh sorry, and reshuffled into distinct political positions. As the expanding economy of the mid-1960s gave way to the soaring inflation of the 1970s, AFDC became the touchstone for increasingly acrimonious debates about the very feasibility of welfare redistribution. In this new economic context, liberal Democrats such as Moynihan and free market neoliberals such as Friedemann, who had once converged on the necessity of the family wage, began to formulate a distinct new political philosophy of non-redistributive non family values. It is at this turning point that we can locate the emergence of both neoconservatism and American neoliberalism as mature political philosophies.